Hello and welcome to The Home Experience, a podcast where we discuss movies and TV shows currently available in the home market. My name is Adam. And I'm Jackson. And today we're talking about Solo, A Star Wars Story. Well, Jackson, it is a new year now, and this is the first podcast, our first podcast of 2019. Yep. Um, Before we get into discussing the feature presentation, which was one of my favorite blockbusters from last year, uh, how was your new year? How how have things been going for you? Uh, Pretty good. It's been it's been a busy, busy time uh, with me just with work and whatnot. Um, Also planning some pretty cool things for the Screen Fever channel. I've got a video essay, another video essay that I'm planning on releasing in the next couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, be sure to keep an eye out for that. But um, but yeah, it's just a it's a new year. So it's uh, trying to get a lot of new stuff off the ground. Um, But it's it's really refreshing to come back to this podcast because like I've said in the past and uh, like I'll say again I, it's just really fun to have an open space to talk about movies that we both love or are both passionate about <laughs> even if we don't necessarily love them uh, fortunately the one we're talking about today is one that I think we both really really like I mean I know I know I really really like it <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think like we did take a little bit of a hiatus. The last one, which was Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, we did, I think, in December. So uh, and and things have changed a bit. Now we're part of Odyssey Radio. Our episodes and our screen fever content air there. And it's kind of a new chapter moving to the next iteration of how we're discussing movies and how we're going to run the podcast and also still putting out a lot of video content on on the Screen Fever channel. Yeah, and we also wanted to start this year off with uh, a Star Wars movie because um, for sentimental reasons, we started off our our first season of our podcast last year, our, our first podcast ever with the Star Wars movie from the previous year, which was Last Jedi. Um, so we both thought it would be a good idea to, to start 2019 off with the 2018 Star Wars movie, which was Solo, um, which fortunately, like I said, we both really liked and we have a lot to say about, but I, I think it'll be cool. This, you know, we've, we've talked at length about this movie with each other in the past. We've both seen it many times, Adam, probably more than me. So, uh, so I'm hoping that this is is going to be a really a fun fun great casual awesome discussion yeah and I, I know people a lot of people didn't see it in theaters so specifically if you're for any reason listening to this and you haven't seen solo yet it is on netflix now it has been out for a while turn the podcast off go watch it it's so much better going in with a, a fresh perspective and and i'm really hoping that people will actually give this more of a chance than they did in theaters and and we're going to get to that in a minute I wanna buckle up, baby. You're after something. Is it revenge? Money? Or is it something else? If you come with us, you're in this life for good. Why not? Solo, a Star Wars story. Solo is directed by Ron Howard, kind of, (laughs) and written by John and Lawrence Kasdan. Uh, It's available to buy or rent on most platforms, and like Adam said, it's available to stream for free with a Netflix subscription. Uh, The film is the latest in the Star Wars story series and follows the iconic gunslinger from George Lucas's original trilogy as he embarks on his very first intergalactic heist. Uh, Yeah, so as Adam also mentioned, um, this is sort of a weird Star Wars movie in that it might be the only Star Wars movie that nobody went and saw. (laughs) Uh, This movie came out uh, in early summer of last year, I think in May, or was it May or April? May. Yeah, it was May. It was right after Infinity War and Deadpool 2, Deadpool 2. So it kind of came on the heels of a very busy blockbuster month. It was a weird time to release a a Star Wars movie. They've all kind of come out in in December, at least since Disney started releasing them. But, but I, I think it, it sort of became a Christmas thing. Like, Oh, you, you know, you took your family and you went and saw a star Wars movie and, and all of them, even rogue one, which was a bit of a gamble. That was the first star Wars story, um, made like over a billion dollars. So, so this should have been a box office success, but, um, it wasn't, I think it didn't even make $400 million, which is about as much as it cost and and for those of you who don't really know too much about film financing uh, if your movie m- doesn't even make back its posted budget it's actually a, a huge loss because 
you're you're not factoring in the the costs of distribution and the costs of ad campaigns and whatnot. Like in total, Solo probably cost a lot more than three hundred and fifty million dollars. So the fact that it only grossed three hundred and fifty million dollars is not good, and that's strange, right? I mean, Star Wars is such a global phenomenon. Yeah, well, historically, Star Wars has always come out in May for the two George Lucas trilogies. The funny thing is Disney always intended to launch the new movies in May. But what happened is um, in 2013, there was a lot of issues with the Force or the Force Awakens script, which at that time was just the episode seven script. And and J.J. pushed really hard against both Lucasfilm and Disney and says, I need six more months to make this movie as, as good as it has to be. And so then that pushed Force Awakens back from may to uh december and and the same with rogue one and what's funny is force awakens did gangbusters numbers in in uh december you know no movie had ever made more than 100 million in a december debut and i think force awakens made something like 240 or 230 220 something ridiculously high they even tried to move the last jedi back to may and and kickstart a may release then i think ryan johnson needed more time and then finally with solo they're like no we're not gonna you know we're not gonna push it back six months we're gonna put it in may which is really strange because historically you know all the all three movies had made a billion or more dollars globally with a December release. And, you know, Solo had was up against the worst odds because there was Avengers Infinity War and Deadpool and Sicario and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, Incredibles 2, all coming out within a few weeks of its release. And it, it's kind of really odd that Disney, you know, dug their heels in and said, no, this movie is going to, you know, the, the most, uh, the spinoff movie that has the least amount of support or interest we're going to put in the busiest season, you know, right next to a bunch of highly anticipated blockbuster movies. Um, I think they made a mistake, plain and simple. I'm not afraid to say it. But it's interesting that you said that 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 was sort of always their intention, even with the even with the other Star Wars movies was to always have them be summer movies. So it's like almost an accident that they all all ended up in December. And yet that accident might have factored heavily into the fact that those movies made so much money. I mean, Force Awakens is still, I think, the highest grossing movie not directed by James Cameron. <laughs> so, yeah, still, yeah still so the this third. Is- yeah, so there's a bit of irony there that the, this was the release date that they always wanted for a Star Wars movie to have, and yet, yeah, it's it, no one really saw it. But, but I mean, if I'm if I'm being perfectly honest, and this is this is coming from someone who really liked this movie too, I I don't know if the release date is fully to blame for the amount of money that it made. Um, I mean, obviously, yes, it was up against some serious competition. It was in May. People weren't used to seeing a Star Wars movie then. But it was also, you know, you... With with every one of these other Star Wars movies, uh, whether it's Rogue One or Force Awakens or Last Jedi, you know, you've been following you've been following characters and you've been following stories that you hadn't seen yet. It's like Ray and Finn and Poe. These were all characters who were new. You didn't know what was going to happen to them. Jin Erso with Rogue One. She was a new character. And even though it was all set in the Star Wars universe. Well, well yeah. And Rogue One, honestly, tied directly in was marketed as a direct prequel to A New Hope. It was something where it's like, if there was any confusion about the plans for the Death Star, the state of the Alliance, it's like, come come see this movie and we're going to give you a story that you've been kind of waiting to see for 40 years. So there was an urgency to Rogue One, like you were saying, that isn't really the case with the Solo prequel. Yeah, well, it's like, yeah, you're right. It, it does tie in directly to New Hope, but... But, and I think the key there is the characters, you know, Rogue One did introduce a completely new cast of characters that we didn't know and, and, and didn't know what was going to happen to them. Whereas I think with Solo, the, the consequence of making a Han Solo prequel movie, regardless of how good it is, and again, this one is very, very good, I happen to think, um, is that we all kind of know how it's gonna end up. Like, we know that he's <laughs> gonna get the Millennium Falcon and end up with Chewie because, you know, that's where we meet him at the beginning of episode four at, in A New Hope. So it's like, I think for a lot of people, and this isn't so much a doc against the movie, just as more just a sad reality of its existence, but I think a lot of people heard that there was going to be a Han Solo prequel and they were like, 
Yeah, but why would I watch that? And it's also, you know, you you also had... It was just sad because it ended up being what I thought to be a very, very fun movie and definitely one of the more fun movies to come out of this new wave of Star Wars movies. Um, but then you also had that expectation of another actor filling the shoes of Harrison Ford, this character that he made so famous. So that also, it also had that going against it. Yeah, and, and there's this critic, uh, this online critic that you and I both adore called Movie Bob. And in his review, he gave Solo a very positive review, but in his review, he argued the interesting part of Han Solo's backstory was already in A New Hope, which is that he's kind of this seedy (laughs) smuggler in a cantina with this giant talking dog as a sidekick. Like that, that's pretty much all you need to know about Han Solo to enjoy him um, in the original trilogy. So there's kind of this argument of how much can this movie add and, you know, or do we really need to see Han Solo demystified and you know kind of what makes Han Solo interesting is he's this roguish unpredictable character but you don't know where he's come from and you you don't know why he is the way he is it's not something like the prequel series where it's like you know what was Anakin Skywalker like how did he become Darth Vader you know we yeah, don't we don't have yeah. that with with Solo now it's funny it sounds like I'm trying to tear this movie apart I actually this is my second favorite movie of the new era I love this movie and and what I think I realize it was trying to do is it wasn't trying to demystify Han Solo. It wasn't trying to justify Han Solo. It was just trying to give us a kick-ass galactic adventure with a young version of one of our <laughs> our favorite characters. You know, I was almost disinterested in trying to say, oh, this is why this happened, and this is this is why he's cynical. You know, it's like, I didn't really get that. Like, yeah, Kira broke his heart. Yeah, he kind of, you know, starts out a little more uh, of a, a good guy than we see him, but it's like, that's not the emphasis of Solo. The emphasis is a good old-fashioned um, y- y- space-faring story kind of in the vein of what George Lucas was trying to do you know taking inspiration from really old 1930s serial adventures and and putting it up against a galactic backdrop and i think and you know i think with a director change when when ron howard came in he you know there was some problem with phil lord and chris miller and the tone they were cultivating and ron howard came in with the intention to bring course correct the tone to uh, get it as close as possible to the original uh, 1977 Star Wars film. And I think that really shows because watching this kind of like, it kind of makes me feel like I I think I would have felt if I saw Star Wars in theaters in the 70s for the first time. It just has this magic spark of adventure. Yeah, the the movie's just trying to show you a good time, really. And, and, and 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 I really respect that. Like, I don't think every movie has to be has to be really meaningful like (laughs) like this uh, you know like this isn't necessarily Han Han Solo's backstory he kind of ends the movie the same character he was at the start you're right you know like he does get his heart broken he does learn you know to be a little bit more careful with who he places his trust in but it's not it's not so much a like character journey in the way something like even like Rogue One was a character journey I mean I think with Jin I'm gonna be bringing this movie up a lot spoiler <laughs> alert but uh, like in the way that Jin sort of ends that movie much more a rebel than she was at the beginning um it, this is not that you know it's it is just Han Solo and Chewbacca having fun for two hours and 15 minutes and you know, if you're not down with that, yeah, you probably didn't like the movie or didn't see it. But yeah, I, I think I speak for both Adam and I when I say that this this really did sort of capture the essence of that character um, that we saw in the original in the original trilogy, um, which is a hard thing to do in and of itself and, and, and gave us a really, really fun time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what was interesting, actually, to bring up your point about a lot of people skipping this because they feel like they didn't need to see it. I have several friends who are young adults, several of which who are are girls. And I know a lot of times it's like Star Wars feels very much like a guy's club only. The fandom is very much like, no, this is a men's club. It's like you don't get Star Wars like we do. And there are a lot of girls who are, are friends of mine who didn't see the movie. They, they either, you know, some of them have said they didn't like The Last Jedi. Some of them said they didn't feel the, the need to see this movie. They thought they were going to hate it. It's like, you know, kind of like that toxic 
response just to the trailers and the initial announcement kind of rubs off even on casual audiences because it feels like no one's excited for the movie. Why should I be? And, you know, since it's come out on DVD and on Netflix, so many of them have gone back and have posted on Facebook like, God, why didn't I see this? This is amazing. I had a blast. And it's like, well, yeah, like that that's what it was supposed to do. It's supposed to entertain you. It's like I think people just kind of need to actually check their expectations at the door and go in and they'll be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, no, and, and I think expectation is the is the key word there. You know, like this this was sort of part of the plan, part of the Disney Star Wars plan from the get-go. I know when they brought Lawrence Kasdan on to write Force Awakens, he was like, oh, I want to do this movie. You know, they had all these spin-offs planned. They wanted to do a whole franchise with Solo. And then, of course, you had this massive director change-up where Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who are most famous for doing the 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 Jump Street and the Lego movies, um, they got fired like I think like three or four weeks before physical production was supposed to end. And then Ron 80, Howard yeah, 80%, came in. 80% had been shot by the time. Yeah. And then Ron Howard came in and, and reshot like 80% of it. So, <laughs> so it's, yeah. you know, you, so you have then, then you have that expectation going into the movie and it's like, it's just, <laughs> I mean, you know, one has to wonder, you know, we kind of live in a film bubble where we hear about that stuff all the time, like general audiences and definitely people in other countries probably don't hear about that kind of negative press, but it was here at least, at least where I am in California and in in the industry that was negative press. Yeah, totally. I mean, it was absolutely unprecedented. I mean, there, there is even an actor, Michael K. Williams, who shot the part of Dryden Voss and then, he, I mean, he just got recast and they reshot everything with his character. And he's he's like a 40 year veteran of the industry. And he said in an interview, he said, I've seen some crazy stuff, but nothing ever like this. Like, the, you know, for, for a movie this expensive and this anticipated to basically shoot the whole thing, very publicly fire the people. Not, you know, it's not like it was a, it was a smooth transition. They were just immediately shown the door and then another director is hired. And it's not like, oh, yeah, he finished up the last 20 percent and, you know, did some reshoot. It's like, no, he reshot most of what Phil and Chris shot. And I mean, you know, for a blockbuster, a blockbuster is pretty damn expensive as is making two of them, you know, for, you know, two for the price of or one for the price of two, essentially. I mean, they shot for 10 months straight. That's crazy. I mean, that's so that's expensive a yeah. for a movie this big. Um, it, it, was, it was not normal. So for people like you and I who kind of you know, have an intrinsic understanding of how movies are made. And, you know, we work for you, you're, you work in the film industry. I've kind of done some part-time stuff in college with it. I'm still in that orbit. Like it, this is just, it's still surreal to think about. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of like, it's something we care about, but your average Joe paycheck from, from middle America, who just wants to take his family to a good time on a Saturday night, the theaters, it's not like he's like going in like, Hmm, I wonder how Ron Howard picked up the slack when comedic directors, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, like he does not care much less. Is he even aware of that? Um, so it's, it's just an interesting thing to think about. No. And you know what too? And it's like, this speaks to the the quality of the movie. It's not something you'd even be able to pick up on from watching it. You know, it's like you, you watch a lot of movies nowadays that sort of go through a lot of reshoots and have these kind of problems behind the scenes, like Suicide Squad or The Predator last year, even even a good movie like Rogue One, which I think Tony Gilroy came in to do the climax. It's like you can you can see the seams like you can see the seams of the movie. You can see where it's like, oh, that was probably a reshoot or, oh, that's probably this director and not this director. And, and what's what I found personally really astonishing about Solo is I, I wasn't able to identify like, oh, that felt like a Phil Lord and Chris Miller bit. Oh, that felt like a Ron Howard bit, you know, like the whole movie goes by very seamlessly. Like if, if you would, if I didn't know ahead of time that this went through like 80% reshoots, I, I would not have been able to guess it. So that that's a, that's a good sign for a movie. Yeah, the movie has a very streamlined and singular voice and tone. It doesn't feel cobbled together in the editing room. And, and, you know, for all the chaos that happens behind closed doors and all the criticism that um, begets in fandom and all the ill will, you know, people feel towards Disney because they're screwing up Star Wars. It's like they are very efficient at making movies. And I think Solo is a prime example of that. Chillingly, yeah. So let's talk a bit about the main attraction, which which in this case is the character of Han Solo. 
Um, apart from the kind of controversy or skepticism doing a Han Solo prequel will bring about just in terms of a story or character sense. One of the biggest questions people had who were both excited and not excited for the movie, I think everyone was there to see how is this kid going to do filling the shoes of Harrison Ford? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when he was cast, it's like he doesn't really have the build or even really the facial features or look of Harrison Ford. I mean, I, I know they did some stuff with his costume and hair and, and, and makeup to kind of blend that and give him more of a Han Solo feel. But, but he, you know, it, it was, it was not like they just hired an impressionist. Like everyone wanted Anthony and Gruber to be hired. Cause it's like, Oh, he looks and sounds exactly like Harrison Ford. And I think you and I came from a perspective of like, well, it's, you know, this isn't a SNL sketch as like Phil and Chris said, it's like, it's a story. You need an actor. You need a craftsman who's skilled with, you know, bringing a story and emotions to life, not just an impressionist. Um, but, but regardless of how you felt, everyone was like, you know, from the first scene, it's like, okay, you know, is this working? What's he like? Does he sound like console? Does he act like console? What's his mannerisms like? You know, I, I mean, I was like that. I was so hypercritical of everything coming out and I was rooting for this movie to succeed, but, but I, you know, I, I didn't know how it was going to play out. And I got to say, I was very, very happy with the approach they took and how it, how it, um, ultimately came to life. Yeah, I, I, I had a lot less baggage in that department, I think, than most Star Wars fans. Then again, I'm not like most Star Wars fans, <laughs> I've found. Um, but but I was I was totally open to the idea of somebody else playing Han Solo, like in the same way that I'm open to the idea of somebody else playing Iron Man. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, sure. You know, Robert Downey Jr. made that character famous, but that doesn't mean somebody else can not step into those shoes and do a good job doing something else and something different. Um, so, so, and I was particularly excited because um, he's played by Alden Ehrenreich, who is at the moment, probably one of my favorite, ac <laughs> favorite working actors. Um, he was absolutely phenomenal in this movie called Hail Caesar, uh, which was a Coen Brothers movie that came out several years ago, which if you haven't seen, I would definitely recommend checking out. Um, uh, he was also in this movie called um, Beautiful Creatures, which um, was sort of one of those like YA movies brought into existence by the whole twilight craze, but which actually, in my opinion, ended up being pretty solid thanks in large part to him. Uh, so, so he's been an actor who I've been paying attention to for a while. And I happen to think is ridiculously talented. So when I, when I heard that he was picking up this mantle and was playing Han Solo, I was like, Oh wow, that'll be cool. That'll be interesting. I, I was, I was not looking for a Harrison Ford impression. I was not even looking for a Han Solo impression. I was just looking for someone who was going to engage me emotionally for two hours and show me a fun time. And, and I thought he did a really, really good job. You know, like I think what, what, what he's able to do with this character that's fun is he's able to bring sort of that confidence and swagger that is very, that, that Han Solo is very known for and also add a level of insecurity to it. Like he is 10 years younger and he's hasn't quite found his wits about him yet, but he's trying really hard. <laughs> um, and, and it was, it was, and that all shown through in his performance. And that's, that's a sign of a really good actor. Yeah. I, I mean, Harrison Ford is really in every sense of the word, a movie star, um, you know, you know, in, in the, like, like there are some, actors or even just people like the way you know when they walk into a room it's like they carry an energy or a charisma or a spontaneity and unpredictability and kind of like an emotionality that makes them so inherently watchable you know i think we see that all the time sometimes there are talented actors who just don't have that presence you know i think agents and directors and everyone's are looking for that that essence that aura and it's like a magnetism. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like it's almost like a scientifically quantifiable magnetic force. You know, it's like and and oh hey, the force. But um but Alden, <laughs> yeah, Alden Ehrenreich is that. 
You know, and not not he's not he does not look or sound like Han Solo per se, but he is a movie star. He is incredibly versatile and such a a nuanced and talented actor with a killer range. Like in some ways, oh my God, I'm gonna draw ire by saying this, but he reminds me of Adam Driver, who you know, I've seen a lot of both Alden and Adam's work, and their range from dark roles to comedic roles to brooding roles to really swashbuckling roles, they do it all without even looking like they're trying trying and and so when Alden came into this movie he I I think you know mixing Kasdan's writing which uh, Larry Kasdan is pretty much responsible for crafting the voice of Han Solo in, in the last you know in two of the three original Star Wars films and of course you know he wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark and was very quintessential in creating the the star image of Harrison Ford he provided a great script which kind of Alden interpreted the right way and said you know I, I gotta capture some of Ford's mannerisms and vocal patterns and, and kind of his swagger and his posture but it's like it, it's my job to bring these scenes to life in the context of the script, not in the context of this greater burden of portraying, you know, trying to duplicate Harrison Ford. And yeah, I mean, the Han Solo in this movie, one one big difference I noticed is he's so much less cynical and so much more eager to please. Like he kind of just like walks into the room with a shit eating grin. It's like, yeah, what are we doing? Like, I thought that went well. It's like, yeah, what, whatever you want, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do something crazy. Let's rob a spice mine. Like, and it was that kind of juvenile drive and energy just just, just gave so much life and urgency to this story and and kind of so much unintentional humor of how it's like, you know, everything's going to shit around them, but Han Solo's just having a great time. And that kind of translates into the audience experience too. He's the definition of like happy to be here in the best possible <laughs> way. Because the character is a little happy to be here too. I mean, you know, Han is has been stuck on this junk planet for most of his life and this is his opportunity to sort of like get out and find his girlfriend and find his place in the world and yeah you could just see that joy on his face the whole time like one of one of my favorite moments in the movie is when you when the millennium falcon jumps into hyperspace for the first time and you've got this great shot where you sort of you pan away from the the iconic star stargate you know stars (laughs) flying around in the background to his face and his face is just like it's like he's seeing this for the first time. Um, and, and and yeah, capturing that I thought was a really good move. Um, what I was struck by too in this movie is also how great the rest of the cast was. That Not really something I was expecting going into it. I think all of the focus and the attention was on Alden and sort of like how he was going to capture Harrison Ford's mannerisms. But, but one of my favorite things about the movie was just how excellent the supporting cast was. Um, Woody Harrelson, who plays his mentor, was incredible. Um, Amelia Clark, who plays Kira, his girlfriend from back on Corellia, gave what I thought was a really good performance. I know a lot of people didn't like her character as really? much, but I, I thought she was really good. Is that good. a consensus yeah. Yeah, that my she whole wasn't family... that great? I didn't know that. Well, it was like... My whole family, they were all like, yeah, I, I wasn't getting a whole lot from her. And then and then I was talking to some friends at work the other day and they were like, yeah, you know, it's sad that she wasn't that good in that movie. Oh I, I disagree. I, I thought I mean, I, I I I'll go to bat for Amelia Clark. I think she's good on Game of Thrones and in other things. <laughs> um, but but what was so impressive about this performance is she's she's playing this character who's who's not supposed to be giving you all of her cards. Um, and, and that can come off as a little distant. Like sometimes she's a little elusive and a little a femme fatale uh, character, essentially. not quite there. Yeah. But, but she does it in such a way that feels very empathetic and identifiable. Um, like she never, like, it, like the whole, the, the movie kept, trying to kind of convince me that she was a bad guy, but never quite did because she's just got this really lovable presence on screen where you, you, you can see the conflict behind her eyes and the, you can see her thinking about her decisions and uh, you, you can see her thought processes sort of projected on her face. And, (laughs) uh, and because of that, I think you didn't get the, full femme fatale character that was maybe written in the script but you got a character which i found very very fun to watch and had really amazing chemistry with the lead so yeah i think what happened you know early on in corelli is is 
Han and Kira were, were, were very much inseparable and they got through incredibly adverse circumstances by leaning on each other. And there was kind of a young love and, and honest and honest love between them. And then, you know, one of my favorite scenes at the beginning of the movie, they get separated when they're trying to basically break out of Corellia in like the first 10 minutes of the movie. And Han's motivation is, you know, Getting, getting a ship, rescuing her, and going to see the galaxy together. And, and, and you know, three years later, after they get separated, um, which is kind of where the movie really starts to kick in when once they meet up again to uh, because of a job that Han Solo's doing with a cr- bunch of criminals, like, th- there's this desire to jump back into that kind of surreal young love. But what Han and Kira both find out is they've they've changed a bit as people, and the circumstances have changed, and they, they feel an immense loyalty and care towards towards each other but they also have to be pragmatic about their circumstances and and god if i can't relate to that in my own life like that's why i don't know if maybe maybe it's because it's so relatable that i don't have a very objective perspective on the character of kira because it's like i've been in love with someone who's like the character of kira so it's like god i am so you know not fit to kind of think about whether it worked or not but but what i think you said that was amazing was like she was very empathetic you know it wasn't it wasn't a caricature and it also wasn't that she was like this manic pixie dream criminal girl or something like it could have gone horribly wrong in its own way um you know she she was a character and i know she actually struggled with the you know the old directing pair she and she struggled with her character in the initial stages of filming but like it it came together and i I, god she's so good yeah i I love her in this movie she also has that movie star presence and that magnetism on screen and and her and alden's chemistry was off the chart i mean some of my favorite scenes in the movie between the two of them no it's it is the it is the definition of an all-star cast you know you had donald glover as so lando good, too yeah. who was that was I, I although that i have to say felt much more like an impression than the than um alden's performance did like you could tell he was doing a lando impression um but gosh, she was doing it so well. I mean, it was just like every every little like every time he like l- like gives a side eye or something or just the way he and he he puts inflections on his words. It it it, it, it really felt like Lando in the purest sense. <laughs> um, so so even though it was much more a a you know I'm coming in to do a Billy D. Williams impersonation, like it 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 worked and 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 was compelling along with Kira and and Han's performances. So I thought he did a really good job too. Yeah, I got to echo that. I mean, yeah, you man, you're right. I, I kind of got a little flack for saying like I, when I coming out of solo, I was like, yeah, you, you know, Han Solo, Alden was great and all the ca- cast was great and and Lando was good, you know, it's it's, it's Donald Glover, he's an amazing actor, but it was he was probably the character who had the least arc or change i felt like out of everyone and and so he basically served a purpose of cultivating nostalgia and being a uh, a uh, foil for han solo versus having his own arc um if if you know I, I am so down to have him come back for his own movie or to have Donald Glover reappear as Lando, you know, but, but in this movie, his, he kind of, his character and his performance felt, felt a little handcuffed. Yeah. Well, I'd be excited to where, see where he would take that character if they were to give him more of a character. Like this isn't <laughs> lot, this isn't Lando, a star Wars story. It is solo a star Wars story, but yeah, you could easily do it. <laughs> you could easily do a Lando movie and it could be really, really cool. And I know, I know it's funny. It's like after this movie came out and bombed, people weren't necessarily clamoring for another solo movie, but the general consensus from pretty much everybody who saw it was like, man, we should get a Lando movie, <laughs> right, um, which I'm like, Hey, I'm just happy to be getting more star Wars movies. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with anything. You could do a Kira movie. I'd go see it. So, <laughs> so, so what other characters kind of fell on your radar as highlights or stuff that you, you came out maybe a little surprised by how much you enjoyed them. The biggest surprise for me personally, um, was, uh, L3, who was Lando's co-pilot slash robot. <laughs> uh, she's played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Who's a incredible British, uh, playwright and TV actress and was just this hysterical foil to, to, to Lando's character, you know, cause he's this very, he's this very sort of refined, 
upper class. Like he's always wearing these very nice capes and, you know, he's cheating at card games and he's, he's got kind of like this sly grin on his face. And L3 is just this relentlessly scrappy, foul mouthed social justice warrior <laughs> robot. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone and it was works. So mad. Oh my gosh. They were so They were mad. so mad, but yeah. like it worked. It was so like everything that came out of her mouth was so funny. And and, and funny in a way that you don't often see in Star Wars movies. I feel like especially since the first one and a lot of this blame can be shouldered on George Lucas unfortunately. I feel like the Star Wars movies have taken themselves progressively more and more seriously like building the world up and and and, and having things quote unquote make sense and and it was refreshing to see a character which was just felt felt so much more like she was out of a, a Spaceballs movie <laughs> as yeah, opposed to a Star totally Wars movie, right. but still selling it. I mean, like she actually gets to have, dare I say, some genuinely emotional moments in the yeah. brief, I think, 15 to 20 minutes she's in the movie that work really, really well. And I think that it was a combination of her performance, which was delivered through a combination of like motion capture and visual effects and actual like... She wore several of the pieces. On her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She basically wore a green screen suit and like half the costume, and they just CGI'd her out and added all the wires. But like the headpiece and some of the other main pieces are actually photographed on set. It's a crazy blend of practical and visual. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it. It was very impressive, and it was a combination of that. It was a combination of her delivery and her performance, and of the writing. I mean, like, I think what, what I was going to say this earlier too, like what, what Lawrence Kasdan has always brought to the, the star Wars movies that I think George Lucas and other people struggled to was an element of reality. I mean, going back to what you were saying about, you know, Kira and Han's relationship, these are, these are two characters in a movie about space pirates doing space pirate stuff. And yet you, were able to watch that and say like, oh, wow, I know exactly how that feels. Those people felt like real characters to me, you know? And, and I think yeah. that's that's the Kasdan magic. That's why he's been so integral to this franchise is be, he's always been able to take these characters from this grand, surreal, larger than life space opera and turn them into flesh and blood people who make people mistakes and <laughs> um and and feel like people you would encounter in your everyday life and that's and that's what makes the mo that's what ends up making movies like the empire strikes back or even force awakens or this so special is the ability to look at all of those characters and say like Oh, you're somebody who I could meet at, who I would would have met at Starbucks or in line at the grocery <laughs> store, or could work with me, you know. And that's really that's really special. You're so right about that because, like, Lawrence Kasdan's career has always been known, uh, you know, has always been built on his ability to create memorable, identifiable characters. I mean, whether you're looking at like the Big Chill or Body Heat. Um, or his work on Star Wars or something I was wanted to reference earlier, which is like his work on Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, he's mm -hmm. the sole screenwriter from that movie. Like Raiders, you know, even if you got the character of Indiana Jones down, you could easily just BS your way through the movie on his charisma. But like there's so much nuance with like Sala or Marion Ravenwood or, or the, the villains. Um, Belloc and it, it's just like that's something you know Kaz and whatever he's involved in these kinds of like fun adventure stories he always elevates it with his character writing and he makes you believe what these characters are going going through better than most other screenwriters working today and so it's just it's such a tremendous blessing to have him back writing for Star Wars because he's bringing that I, I think humanity is the best word he's bringing that humanity to the story Totally. I like the humor he brings to it, too. I, I know, you know, a lot of people were were very nonplus at Last Jedi for for leaning very heavily into a more physical type of humor than the franchise had seen before. You know, like that's that's the kind of movie that like if you if you were to turn the sound off and just watch Last Jedi on its own. And again, full disclosure, this is coming from somebody who thinks that Last Jedi is the best Star Wars movie. Um, <laughs> you know, if you were to watch that movie without sound, you would probably laugh at most of the jokes because they're, they are very physical and the camera moves in very intentional ways to hit punchlines and whatnot. Uh, whereas I think with Kasdan, so much of the humor is 
baked into the writing and baked into the 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 subtle jabs certain characters will throw at each other like what we we were watching it together i think last week and it was <laughs> there was this moment where you know kira and han are on the millennium falcon and 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 she's like in lando's cape room trying on all his capes and it's this kind of seductive scene um and i forget what she says to him but there's like the shot is framed where you see like the so the, what's the plan she yeah says, so oh yeah so what's the plan yeah she says what's the plan and you cut to this reverse shot of han and again like if you're watching without sound it would be nothing because it's it's all sort of in the delivery and the writing but he like makes this subtle nod to the bed which is in like the background and he's like oh well i was thinking we could and she's like no i meant about the heist and you (laughs) and and you had you had seen it like five times and you'd never even noticed that gag. I've seen it close to 20 times. I've, wow. I've seen it close to 20 times. I <laughs> you, never noticed that. I think that. you have a it's, problem. It's embarrassing, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that that's how subtle it is. I watched it 20 times and didn't notice. But it's in the writing. My, my point is that stuff like that is in the writing. You know, like if you were to watch Solo without sound, you might even mistake it for a gritty drama. Uh, they got Bradford Young to shoot it. He's done like all of Ava DuVernay's non Disney movies. <laughs> uh, so it's, so it's got this sort of like, you know, a little gritty, darker, more underworld kind of feel to it. Um, but then you listen to the dialogue and you listen to the character interactions and there's so much, and it's just like a mile a minute, just like jabs and jokes and, and double entendres and stuff that, that that's, that's more unique to Kasdan's work in the star Wars universe than it is to say George Lucas or Ryan Johnson's work. Yeah, there is this scene um, when our, our heroes arrive on Kessel and they meet up with kind of the overlords of the spice mine. And, you know, their plan to infiltrate and steal the coaxium MacGuffin, is yeah. to, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the MacGuffin juice or whatever, is to <laughs> offer up Han Solo and Chewbacca as slaves. And then, you know, they'll break free and, you know, break out the coaxium. But, like, like there's this scene where the, you know, the slave owner is like, okay, we're going to take these guys. We were going to take Han and Chewbacca to be clipped and tagged. And Han just looks at Kira and goes, what are they clipping? (laughs) And it was just like this completely irreverent throwaway line that like, if you blink, you'll miss it because there's so much going on in that scene. Um, I think some of that comes from John Kasdan as well. There's kind of like a, a generational, a really welcomed generational split in the writing because like, Hmm. I think John Kasdan brought a lot of authenticity to these young voices like Han and Kira because like he, he actually directed a movie called the first time, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's about two (laughs) high schoolers in their first relationship and having their first, you know what together and like needless to say i saw a lot of kazan experimenting with his uh john kazan experimenting with his character storytelling and his authentic angsty young voice in that movie which was then manifested in a much better form in solo and i think um i mean kathy kennedy even said god i mentioned god forbid i mentioned her name but kathy kennedy even said that like um larry kazan brought this kind of sage wisdom to the narrative and to maybe some of the more experienced characters like beckett or or, or Dryden Voss, but John Kasdan brought this more modernized humor. I, I think like potty jokes are just funnier in my generation and more culturally acceptable. And that's why this this kind of ended up, you know, that's why so many of those ended up in the movie. So having a father and son write the script is a really bold idea. You know, it could go terribly wrong in so many ways, but yeah. but in this case it was incredible. I I love the script more than I should. <laughs> I, I would I would be curious to know which one of them wrote the L three bits, uh, <laughs> like I just because it because it is so it borders on irreverent sometimes. There's this scene where basically L three and Kira sit down to talk about sex and. <laughs> <laughs> there's this very strong there's this very strong implication in that scene that Lando and that robot have done the do and it's and I'm yeah. like wondering like was that a was that a robosexual which Kasdan was that or was that or was that residue from the from the Phil Lord and Chris Miller movie I know I, I know I, I know that part of the reason they had gotten fired was that they had they had let the actors do a lot of improvisation um, which yeah you know, if you're, if you're a Kasdan, you're very precious about the written words. So I can imagine that created some friction, but, it, but watching it, I'm curious to be like, well, how much, how much of that, what maybe was 
improvised on set. And again, it's a testament to the movie that I have no idea. It all It is all just the movie. And I thought by and large, it worked pretty well. Yeah, it's funny. You know, right before this movie came out, um, you know, they released information about all the characters. And part of what was teased was the fact that, like, Lando was pansexual and his robe, you know, there's this robot that fights for droid rights. It was so funny. I logged onto YouTube one day and from one of those, uh, you know, those channels that basically are just making hit pieces on whatever Disney is doing with the yeah. Star Wars franchise, they posted this video in the thumbnail. Where the, the headline was like, SJW droid in Han Solo movie. I'm not joking. Exclamation point, exclamation point, <laughs> exclamation point. I can't even imagine how you'd pitch it to Disney. It's like, yeah, there's this robot and she makes a ton of sex jokes and she's having sex with Lando Calrissian. And like, you know, for better or worse, I think it's really funny they added it in because it caught me off guard. And, you know, I, I very much have an irreverent sense of humor. It's like they allowed me and my Boy Scout troop to write a Han Solo movie. I'm like, this is the movie I always wanted to see. So, were, so Adam, for you, were there any other particular elements that stood out as exemplary with this? I know I, I know I mentioned Bradford Young's cinematography, which was pretty controversial, actually. I know a lot of people didn't like it. But uh, but was there anything like that, that that really jumped out at you or that you really stuck with or resonated with just about the physical filmmaking? Yeah, I mean, I think the cinematography is something that I personally liked. It is kind of paradoxical to think a movie so fun you know, and it's kind of like, yeah, space pirates on a quest. It's like you expect this bright, colorful adventure, and most of it is very dark and desaturated. I First off, I think the photography is beautiful, like 90% of the time. I definitely think he went overboard. I think that Bradford Young sometimes, you know, has a lot of good ideas, and sometimes he needs to be put in check. The majority of the work is, is so textured and nuanced, and, you know, even the chaos or the shadows are intentional. They're planned, and even more so why I think it works is it's that's what real life looks like. Like, I look at this movie, and when they walk into this tavern, you know, all, the only lighting in that, in that, in the gambling scene or in that, you know, the CD bar that's, you know, built into the cliff of that snow planet. It's like, if there was, you know, if there were space wizards and space pirates in another galaxy, this is what I feel like it would look like. You know what I'm saying? It's not so perfectly lit and shiny. It's, 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 you believe the kind of, uh, decay that's in this world and that just makes it so much more real and it makes the adventure feel more real because all the locations and the way they're photographed give such an insane um, sense of realism uh, and, and I do think while well, some of that's the production design and some of that's the general intention of the script, I think Bradford Young took that to the next level and say, let's let's make, you know, let's be bold. And instead of making a really happy pop filter, you know, multicolored aesthetic, let's make this look like a 70s drama. And I I know there was some problem with the projection. I think part of the reason people hated it is that something like most theaters don't have their light balance or whatever up to up to par and so a lot of the projections actually were underexposed so some of the scenes that looked dark to us on like a properly calibrated screen looked indecipherable to theater going yeah, audiences so really I, I understand yeah. that there were some technical hiccups and and issues but but yeah no this the cinematography was something that was was different and if we want star wars to expand not everything can look like a new hope and, and this was this was a stylistic choice that that gave us something new so yeah, th that was my long-winded reflection on your question. I want to throw it back to you and, and see if there's anything that stood out to you in terms of production elements. No, yeah. I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm of the camp that... I always want to see new things when it comes to Star Wars movies. Um, I always want to hear new things. I always want to experience new things. And it's kind of ironic that this... Because this is a movie which I think more than any of the other Disney Star Wars movies leans very very heavily on the nostalgia pops to give you a sense of gratification and yet at the same time you know it doesn't look at all like any other star wars movie like it looks v much more grounded you know it, because of bradford young's cinematography it looks a lot more down to earth and real like you're in there with these characters as opposed to watching a movie about them um Certainly, and yeah, i and yeah. i very much and, and i i very much appreciated that you know and I, I appreciated that about the score too because as much as it did sort of sound like a john williams score and as much as john williams actually did compose of the score and as many <laughs> as many motifs as they brought in from from other 
other movies from other Star Wars movies. Like I know they play the the asteroid music from Empire Strikes Back when they're doing the Kessel Run oh, and they're so weaving good. between the asteroids. There was all of this new music that sounded so uniquely John Powell, like like Emphis Nest, who's this other space pirate who's trying to also rob them of the MacGuffin for most of the movie has this theme that comes on whenever she comes on screen that just does not sound like anything you've heard in a Star Wars movie. It's like these chanting voices and it's this very, I mean, I guess the closest point of reference I can use is probably the Ewok songs that they're singing at the end of <laughs> at the end of Return of the Jedi but but it also sounded very John Powell that's something that John Powell is very known for he did the Ice Age movie scores and those incorporated a lot of like voices and sounds like that so it was just cool to see it was just cool to see different artists put their stamps of personality on on what was otherwise a franchise movie. You know, I think that's what makes what like going back to what I was saying, what, what has always made star Wars so special are those little stamps of personality. And yeah, between the music and the writing and the cinematography, this movie was just a treasure trove of that, regardless of how well it's yeah. strung together. But I do think it's strung together very well. <laughs> it's a good movie. <laughs> Well, 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 not to shatter the magic, but you did mention that you did have some problems with it. And just for the sake of giving giving our listeners a full <laughs> picture of this movie, what what yeah, so what 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 didn't ring quite as true to you? I guess is the the, the question I would ask. You're hurting me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm um, uh, yeah, um, kind of takes it. Basically, I can pinpoint the very moment where it starts to fall off the tracks, which is when Enfist Nest goes on her monologue and says Crimson Dawn is, you know, oppresses the galaxy and we're going to use the coaxium to start a rebellion, hint, hint. And then it's like, okay, now we're back in Dryden's, you, you know, vessel. And there's like a triple cross, which was very confusing. The fo- I mean, I've seen it 20 times. Now it makes sense. But the first two times it was kind of confusing and felt a little synthetic and it didn't feel like the character stakes were there. And I mean, really my only issue with the movie or my own, my issues of the movie largely reside in the last act and how it is handled or or resolved. Um, I want to say it's a perfect movie, and it, it's not. Like it did recapture the magic, but it had a very flawed third act. So like it almost stuck the landing. I almost want to give it a perfect rating because of how much I enjoy it on a deeply personal level that I can't you know I can't quantify. I just feel that way. Wish they got an extra six months to reshoot some of that and and work out the kinks. So is it like too convoluted? Or do you think it was too convoluted? Like those, like that triple cross at the end? It loses the momentum. It starts to get unnecessarily mm. sentimental and kind of forcing themes versus letting them organically develop. I mean, if nothing else, if I want to frame this in a complimentary way, it doesn't rise to the occasion that the first two acts did. You know, it doesn't display this effortless mm. greatness that the first hour and a half of the movie showed. And as such, it feels flawed and, and not up to par. It's, it's, it's funny that you say that because I, for me, I think like the last act didn't bother me too much. I didn't find the whole triple cross as confusing as everybody else did. Uh, what I actually, what, what bothered me more about the plot and the story was really actually the first half. It, it, it's not that the movie is bad in any way, but it does take its... It does take a while to like really get going. Like for me, the movie really hits its stride and comes to life when Han meets Kira again. And that's like, gosh, that's like 45 40 minutes, minutes to an in. hour yeah. into the, yeah, it's, you probably know the exact time. I code. know like You've the exact so time code, times. yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was like, it was, it was like, yeah, you, you, you had this whole sequence with a train heist where you sort of. Um, it's like Han's very first heist, and, and and I and I get that you needed that going into the rest of the story, but after finishing it, you know, I I I couldn't shake the feeling that it was a two hour and fifteen minute movie that would have made a super awesome, really tight one hour and fifty minute movie. Um, and I, I I think a lot of that fat that ended up making it feel a little bit more exhausting. <laughs> Uh, for me, was definitely in the first half. You know, it, it, it takes a while for the movie to really land on a, like, oh, this is where this is going, this is what this is about. But, that all being said, that's not to say it's not fun and exciting and great. That train and heist yeah. sequence is 
really something to behold. It's exciting to see what what a train heist looks like in the Star Wars universe. And I loved how they sort of dreamed that all up. I love how the train sort of like swivels on the tracks 360. I just thought it was, you know, it's 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 a fun movie. There was really only one point in the movie where I was like genuinely like, OK, that was terrible. Um, and it was and it was the Darth Maul cameo at the end. Like it wasn't even really a plot point in the movie. It was just like it felt like the movie kind of like had to stop itself for fan service. It was like, oh, look, and Darth Maul is the bad guy because why? I guess because you wanted to see Darth Maul ignite his lightsaber again. It was just weird. It was just weird. And it felt like I was being like, like that didn't feel like it was written by... (laughs) by by the, the Kasdans. <laughs> um you know that felt that so felt true. like Disney watched the movie that felt like Disney watched the movie and they were like hmm hmm I think you need another reference in there and they just had to kind of shoehorn that in um either that or they yeah. were planning for planning for future movies I don't oh, know no, I don't know why case. it needed to that be That was Barton. the case yeah they the were plan was to kind of launch into Crimson Dawn's spin-offs or TV show or a solo sequel like they were laying the groundwork for something much bigger um, which is 90, 90% sure is not going to happen at this point. You know, I will say in defense of that one scene, The Clone Wars, which is canon, has a, a very elaborate story um, about Darth Maul and his survival and, and his resurrection and kind of his reascension to power or relevance. And, you know, while it's never a proper answer to say, just go watch this animated show, the movie will make sense. Like, I don't believe you should have to do that. The movie should stand on its own two legs. It's not coming out of nowhere. Like, like the Darth Maul story, even in current canon, did not end in that scene in Phantom Menace where he gets sliced in half. So, you know, his appearance in the movie wasn't really my problem. My problem was with the way the scene was executed and how he randomly ignites his lightsaber and you know his his john williams theme swells and it's like oh hey in case you didn't understand in case you're completely stupid it's darth maul yeah yeah Yeah. and it's just like oh for a movie that is so modest otherwise and its aspirations and the production elements this was just so painfully out of place i mean it could have been cut i mean nothing would have been lost Forget context. Like I, I was just like, why are you in this movie? Like this movie. Like, like they were like they were able sure. to integrate, integrate, integrate. Oh my gosh, I can't even talk today. Integrate? They were able to integrate, <laughs> integrate. Blech. Forrest Whitaker's character in Rogue One was from the Clone Wars, and I, I didn't even know that. I think until after I saw the movie, I was like, oh well, oh okay. It, it like he was a character in the story you know, whose role made sense in the context of the story. So it didn't really matter. You didn't need to have seen the Clone Wars to understand anything, and it didn't really even matter. Um, Whereas in this movie, it's like, regardless of Darth Maul's history, I was just like, why do we have this scene? It was was just such a naked, like, fan (laughs) service. It was just such naked fan service. In a movie where the rest of the fan service felt fun and subtle and integrated in in fun ways like 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 you know getting to see the falcon for the first time or or like i said that shot where han gets to sort of go into hyperspace for the first time you know like han shooting first (laughs) another but like that was subtle that was subtle like i didn't even i didn't even get that until the second time i watched it that i was like oh i got it i because he shot him first because on shot first yeah, you, yeah if you don't if you don't know what we're talking about go watch the movie <laughs> so obviously you know this is a movie we both love very deeply we might have some problems with it but it rings very very true with us this is our definition of a really solid star wars movie adam what would you rate this i'm gonna go with a four and a half out of five i actually it started out as a four out of five i think that extra half point is just you know, awarded due to the immense sentimentality I feel towards this movie and, and how it is like a comfort food. Like I can watch this movie instead of eating a bar of chocolate and feel the same kind of relief and love and warmth. And it's like, you know, for, for a piece of entertainment to do that to me, give me this like emotional chemical reaction. I, you know, I I have to give credit where credit's due. Um, so yeah, four and a half out of five is, is I think the most honest rating I can give it. What about you? 
I, well, I didn't quite get that last half star uh, that you did, but I got four. I got four stars, um, <laughs> and and they are very they are four very very positive stars. Um, like I said, uh, you know, I we all look for different things in Star Wars movies. Like some people love it for the space physics. Somebody love it for the some people love it for the lore. Some people love it for the characters. I just love this franchise because I think it more than probably any other franchise has delivered on the promise of solid blockbuster entertainment so consistently. And this is just quintessential solid blockbuster entertainment. You know, like I've, I have, yeah. I have not seen it as many times as Adam, but I've seen it several times. I've really, really liked it each time and I'm excited to watch it again. So next time on the home experience, we are going to be discussing Dan Gilroy's horror comedy film, Velvet Buzzsaw. Um, it just came out on Netflix a couple of weeks ago. This film has generated a lot of buzz. Ha ha. Oh, <laughs> buzz. snap. Because Buzzsaw. Oh, man, it's been a long day. Anyway, um, but uh, this is uh, a very, very strange film um, that Adam and I both have a lot of opinions about. Um, yep. Adam and Robert Yanis Jr. did a discussion about the trailer, which you can go and watch on our channel right now. So definitely check that out and check the movie out before listening to our podcast because it will be very, very heavy on spoilers. Uh, yeah, so stay posted for that next time. Uh, stay posted for my video essay, which will be out very, very shortly, and for more episodes of The Home Experience. Uh, but until next time, I'm Jackson. And I'm Adam. And have a great week. <laughs>